Welcome to Best Way session number two. We're glad you're able to join us. Sorry you missed our in-person session. This video makes it so that you can watch and get caught up with us. Remember to enter your data throughout the week on the online scorecard. There is a button that you can use to download the workbook for this lecture. Following this will be two lectures on health and then everyone will break up into groups for discussion. And since you're not here with us for those groups for discussion, you'll need to go through the workbook yourself and make sure you understand the material. Definitely touch base with your table helpers. If you've got any questions, they'll be glad to help you through this material. Enjoy the lecture. Um, I really appreciate all the work that's going on behind the scenes. Lucas has been very busy today trying to coordinate all of the information that you all have been faithfully turning in. Uh, I did want to uh, make you aware of um, a few things that most of you on this meeting are probably aware of since you made it in here, but just for sake of um, sake of argument, allow me to share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? <clears throat> yes, sir. Up. All right. This is southbaysda.org. This is our church website, and you see a link up here that says best way. If you click that link, you can always access the Zoom meetings right there. So pass it on to your friends. If they do want to join the meeting, they need to probably do it no later than the next couple of days, because once you've missed the first few meetings, it's probably not reasonable to expect people to be able to jump in. <clears throat> um, so for the duration of this program, you should be able to go to this link and find this information. This is extremely important. Um, Lucas, could you reach out to Patrice McCoy and give her the link? I can't really do it right now. Um, I can do it. I can do it. Don't worry about it. I got you. Thanks. Appreciate it, Nita. Um, just a reminder, I think most of you have been doing your daily scorecard, but here's how to access that. If you want to do the Facebook page, I have been extremely impressed with the amount of time that Dr. Nita Hillman has been putting into this Facebook page. All sorts of great information, recipes. She's going walking no matter what the weather is. Hope some of you have a chance to go walking with her and her beautiful daughter. Um, so it's just a lot of good information at the Facebook uh, page. And then down here at the bottom, if you have not yet done this, we need you to fill out the evaluation and consent form um, uh, by the end of the meeting, uh, either this evening or immediately following the meeting. Uh, we need to have your consent for you to participate in this program. So appreciate your um, cooperation with that. There are, uh, for those of you who missed last week, if you want to watch the excellent presentation, you can go here and click on Nita's smiling face and listen to the video of her presentation from last week. Uh, those of you who have missed um, and have not yet been able to, um, have not yet been able to um, um, get on this program, this is your first night, you will want to go back and watch that. Also, you can get week one of the workbook there. Today is our second lesson. And so you can access uh, the second page of the workbook here. I believe Lucas also emailed that out to you. I also want to draw your attention to something that is very exciting to me. Um, there's been a lot of great interaction going on in the groups. And Chris Anderson and Faith Anderson said in their group, people are really excited. They're wanting to try new recipes, figure out how to cook healthfully and things of that nature. And uh, they spent a lot of time working on this. And out of that came this healthy cooking link. If you cook, click on that healthy cooking link, you see uh, the beautiful and talented Faith Anderson and her uh, talented husband creating a super salad. And that is definitely a large salad. I think it would take even the large Anderson family uh, several days to finish that thing. Uh, Faith's also making some granola here. You can make homemade peanut butter. And Rachel Detweiler, who going, we're going to hear from tonight, has a presentation about chickpeas. We anticipate we'll be adding additional recipes um, to this, um, recipe demonstrations to this particular link. But I also want to draw your attention to this small link right up at the top. If you click that link, it will take you to dwtdhickson.com, the recipe section. That's just clicking the recipe section of dwtdhickson.com. We'll tell you more about Dinner with the Doctor, I'm sure, at some point. Uh, we have our February Dinner with the Doctor the third Monday in February, so we'll tell you more about that later. But there are lots and lots and lots of great recipes there that you can either search by category or by alphabetical order. So you can, um, 
You can go to all of these different recipes. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of healthy, tasty, easy to prepare recipes that I wanted to um, draw your attention to. This is definitely um, something that you will want to uh, know more about. So let me stop sharing my screen. Um, at this time, I believe I wanted to give the time to Dr. Nita Hillman. I believe she has something that she wants to poll us about so that we can uh, kind of, um, uh, that she'll give us the results later. Dr. Hillman, are you ready to do that at this time? Um, I was going to, and it's not allowing me to put up the poll, but um, that's okay. What I will do is um, for anybody who would like to um, walk this week on Thursday, um, because it's in the morning, we have more options. Um, there are three options, um, walking at Heritage Park, um, or sorry, walking at Heritage, Heritage Park, um, walking um, closer towards the Oro Oglethorpe area, um, at Gilbert Park, or if you would like to walk closer towards the Udawa area at the um, track behind Holsey. Um, Holsey, if, so if, you don't, if you'll just give me a general idea, if you want to say Heritage Park, which is right close to Erlanger East, um, to if you want to say oh, West to um, Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, or further east, north and east towards um, Udawa, just let me know which of those three options in the chat, and I'll figure that out from, those, from what you put in the chat. Lucas, this, were you this able Thursday to at 10 30 p.m i'm sorry i was asking lucas if he knew a way to make the poll active there somehow i am currently not a host and i've yeah, been sorry, trying I'll, to get my host powers back sorry i'm <laughs> so giving I, it I don't back know. to you right now I'm giving it back to you right now all right yeah but i will yeah. sorry anyway but i will okay so if you want to uh hike at one of those three areas uh that nita outlined please put in the chat what your preference is and she'll kind of uh take a look at that uh, we want to encourage people to be able to be together and walk outdoors in a COVID safe manner. And so um, uh, that's what we'll do for that particular poll. And um, at this time, I want to, without further ado, introduce Dr. Edwin Abraham. Dr. Abraham is our other presenter for the Best Way program this year. And I've known him for quite a long time. Um, when I went to medical school, Dr. Edwin Abraham was my sweet mate. And Dr. Selwyn Abraham, his brother, actually was in my medical school class and he was my roommate. And then all of us got married and so we didn't do that anymore. But um, we spent uh, one year studying together and um, of course he's two years ahead of me, uh, therefore older and wiser. Um, Dr. Edwin Abraham is an anesthesiologist in our local area here. And he has a unique, um, a unique perspective on lifestyle. And his wife is also a physician. Uh, they have two lovely boys. Uh, his wife is an internal medicine physician. And she also works as a hospitalist on a part-time basis. And um, we just really enjoy knowing the Abraham family. And I'm very excited to um, hear from Dr. Abraham tonight about the topic of exercise. So at this time, we'll spotlight Dr. Edwin Abraham, if I can find him on my screen here somewhere, or maybe you can do that, Lucas, and uh, we'll give the time over to him. Thank you, thank you. Let me try to share my screen here. Okay. All right, can you guys see my screen? All right. Yes. Uh -huh. Hello, it's like uh, Eric said, uh, my name is Edwin Abraham. Uh, welcome back to Best Way. I hope you all had a successful first week. Congratulations on completing one week. Uh, nine more to go. <laughs> and if there are any new participants, welcome to you also. My topic today is gonna to be on exercise. Um, exercise is crucial for successful weight loss. However, uh, exercise by itself is not a great way to lose weight. Then again, dieting by itself is also not a great way to lose either. Um, 
Each of them can work alone, but the best way to lose weight is to do a combination of dieting and exercising together. Modest diet combined with modest exercise works best, as we shall see. Now, what's the definition of physical fitness? Physical fitness is a state of physiologic well-being that is achieved through a combination of good diet, regular physical exercise, and other uh, uh, practices that help you. Fitness is the ability to get your daily work done while strong and alert. At the end of the day, you should not be too tired and you should have enough energy for some leisure activities and to meet any emergencies that may come along. All right, exercise is good for you. I'm sure many of you heard this. Uh, it combats health conditions and diseases. Heart disease is the number one killer in America. Exercise lowers your heart rate, your resting heart rate, and your blood pressure. In some cases, exercise can reduce or eliminate your blood pressure pills. So exercise helps lower your bad LDL cholesterol and will help raise your good HDL cholesterol. All these things which I mentioned help with your, exercise, with, with your heart. In the Best Way program, we are uh, going to look at how exercise can lower your weight, which will also help your heart. Exercise has other benefits. Uh, exercise uh, keeps your bones strong. This prevents osteoporosis and fractures. People who exercise don't get tired as easily at work or, or in their activity. They're able to relax more. Those who exercise can concentrate better and are able and are often able to be more disciplined and productive. Those who exercise have more self-confidence and enjoy life more. Increased joy of living means not only having a better quantity of life, but also a better quality of life. Now, if you look at this slide, if you eat less and don't exercise, your metabolism will actually slow down some. Your metabolism may slow to match what you eat. This will result in less and less weight loss, even though you're sticking to your diet. Now, if you eat less and keep up your exercise, your metabolism doesn't have a chance to slow down. If you're exercising more than usual, your metabolism may actually increase. Not only will weight come off during your exercise, but with an increased metabolism, your weight may continue to come off even when you're resting or doing your sleep at night. Who would not want to lose weight when you sleep or rest? That would be easy. Now, the next few minutes, we're going to go look at some studies on the effect of exercise. This is an important study right here, uh, comparing walking with more vigorous forms of exercise and preventing heart attacks in women. This was a large study, over 70,000 women who were nurses. Um, all the women were free of heart disease and cancer at the start of the study. They were followed for eight years. And during that eight years, about 645 heart attacks occurred during that time. All types of exercises uh, were evaluated and compared through a scientific calculation called a MET. Now MET means a metabolic equivalent of task, which is pretty much a unit that measures uh, and estimates the amount of energy used by the body during physical activity compared to resting metabolism. It tells you how much energy you're using in an activity. So exercise levels were divided into five categories and there were nearly 15,000 women in each group. The middle row here, that's highlighted in red, uh, this shows the average exercise level of each group. On the left side in column one, you have the sedentary group with not, not too active, but 0.8 mets of activity. On the right side in column five, you have, uh, you have the most active group with an average of 35. I'll put my mouse over here, 35 is there. Now, if you look over here, there were almost exactly twice as many heart attacks in those who didn't exercise, 178, compared with only 89 of those who exercised the most. There were over 100,000 person years of tracking and observation in, this, uh, in each group. This was a very large study. And usually larger studies are much more believable. 
Now, um, here this graph shows like there was an increase, this shows this graph over here that there was an increase, with the increase in exercise, there was a dramatic drop in heart attacks. Now, even those with little exercise had a 30% reduction in heart attacks compared to those who did no exercise, and that's the first part over there. Those who exercised the most, the column five, had a 54% reduction in heart attack rates. That's amazing. Now, a special analysis was done in the same study of the nearly 50% of women who, didn't, who never did any vigorous exercise or activity. This group was divided by the amount of walking they did. They left out of the analysis those who could not walk for various reasons. They measured the number of hours walked per week and the pace or speed at which the people walked. This sub-analysis included many thousands of women in each group. There were nearly 50,000 person years of observation in each of the five groups. And this row again shows the MET, uh, the activity level. The first column is those who did not walk at all. And the last column, column five, was those who walked the most. And then if you look over there, the last row shows you that there were nearly twice as many heart attacks in the group that didn't walk, 92, compared to those who walked, that was 57. The graph is nearly identical to the previous graph that showed the reduction in heart attacks with vigorous exercise. Those who walked even a little bit on a regular basis had a 31% reduction in the risk of a heart attack. And uh, this slide shows that those who walked the most had a 50%, 54% uh, reduction in the risk of a heart attack. So walking is as effective as any other form of exercise in preventing heart attacks. Now here, the same study showed walking three miles per an hour was much more effective than walking less than two miles per an hour. This is another scientific study we'll be looking at. It shows the benefits of exercise. In this study, there were 2,300 men, uh, the ages, they were around 50 years old and this was done in 1970. They were surveyed at, uh, and at the start at 50 years old and when they were 60, when they were 70, when they were 77 and at 82. They were followed for 35 years. Now, um, if you looked at, they looked at the exercise and mortality rates. Now 1300 died during the study, that was about 60%. Now this data shows that there was a 32% reduction in mortality in the high exercise group compared with the low exercise group. The reduction was not as dramatic because these people uh, only increased their exercise once they were older. But the point is that exercise reduces the risk of dying. It also helps the person lose weight. Uh, the, the actual conclusion of the authors, they quoted this, increased physical activity in the middle age is eventually followed by a reduction in mortality to the same level as seen among men with constantly high physical activity. This reduction is comparable with that associated with smoking cessation. That's amazing, like stopping smoking is almost as good as exercising. Here's a recommendation for US adults from the American College of Sports Medicine. They reviewed all the available literature on exercise and weight loss and then drew some conclusions. Exercise has a dose response effect on weight loss. What do you mean by that? The more exercise you do, the more weight you lose. Little exercise, and they define it at less than 150 minutes per week, results in little or no weight loss. Medium amounts of exercise that's greater than 150 minutes a week results in four to four and a half to six and a half pounds loss. Now, heavy exercise, those that work uh, 225 to 420 minutes a week loses the most, 11 to 16 pounds loss. Now, just to keep in perspective, 225 minutes is 45 minutes of walking five days a week. 422 minutes per week is a little bit over an hour and 10 minutes a day. Now, data from Bestway also show that those who walk an hour a day lose significantly more weight than those who walk 30 minutes a day. But 30 minutes a day results in much more weight loss than those who don't get any exercise. 
<laughs> to maintain your weight after weight loss, some studies suggest you need 200 to 300 minutes of physical activity per week to minimize weight regain. Well, once you lose the weight you want, you need to keep up your exercise. Now, 200 to 300 minutes is about 30 to 40 minutes uh, per day of exercise. Here's a yet another study showing the benefits of exercise in people who are severely obese. Uh, the severely obese usually have trouble losing weight and getting exercise. This was a much smaller study. It had included 130 participants. They were middle-aged, mostly women. A third were African-American. 75% of the people had a BMI greater than 40, and that's uh, pretty severe. Half of the, they divided the group in half. Half of them did diet and exercise from the start. The other half did diet only for six months and then began their exercise program. Here are the details. The diet was about 1,200 to 2,100 calories per day and included about 30% fat, 50% carbs, 20% protein. The exercise was 60 minutes, five days a week. And the goal was 10,000 steps per day. The people who diet and exercise lose significantly more amount of weight than those who just diet. Note, uh, there is some for considerable fatigue or reduction in adherence in both of the groups. The progress was the greatest in the first six months in both groups and modest in the second six months. So it's important that you, the changes you make, you keep it permanent. Uh, it should be a lifestyle change for long-term and this will help for your long-term success. Here are the, uh, the conclusion that the authors came up with. The results countered the dogma that lifestyle interventions won't work in people with severe obesity. So here we have a treatment that works and is cost-effective and it's a shame that they won't reimburse for it. This study shows that it's possible to lose weight with exercise and diet, even if you're severely obese. What types of exercise are best for weight loss? I mean, walking, jogging, running, bike riding, swimming, strength exercises, a lot of choices. Endurance exercises are better off for promoting weight loss. We recommend walking. Almost everyone can walk. It is easy to do, doesn't require much equipment, and you can do it anywhere. People can walk in parks around their neighborhoods or to even walk in their homes safely. Uh, walking in place can be effective. You don't have to go to a gym. I hope you all had a chance to virtually or walk with uh, Dr. Hillman this past week. It's good to walk with others just to keep yourself accountable. Now, we don't recommend jogging or running for those who are overweight. Uh, this may injure your hips, knees, or ankles, and uh, we don't want any injuries. Bicycle riding and swimming are good. Uh, these exercises are not hard on your joints. Some weightlifting and strengthening exercises have built muscles. Those who build muscles may not seem, may not seem to lose weight very fast because you're actually losing pounds of fat if you'll be gaining some pounds of muscle. Overall, however, the endurance exercises will burn off more weight and keep your metabolism elevated. Now, it's important to be safe when you exercise, dress appropriately for the weather, as Dr. Hillman did uh, when she was Zooming, wearing you know, warm clothes when you're out in the cold. Loose fitting clothes are good when it's warm. Wear good shoes. Um, your heart, you gotta make sure your heart beats a little faster. You should, uh, you should uh, get a little shorter, mildly shorter breath. That's normal, you may perspire a little bit. We don't want you to exercise too vigorously. As you walk or exercise, it's good to check your pulse periodically. You can check your pulse manually by just, you know, putting your fingers over your artery and counting. Or there are cheap de devices out there like watches and stuff that can tell you, tell you your pulse. If you have any unusual symptoms while walking, you should check with your doctor. For most people, a safe target heart rate is calculated by subtracting your age from 180. For example, if you're 45, 180 minus 45 equals your target heart rate, 135. You wanna keep your heart rate at 135 or less while you walk or exercise. As your endurance improves, you'll be able to walk faster and still keep within your target heart rate. 
this is key here, the difference between losing half a pound per week and losing two pounds per week is walking for 30 minutes, five days a week. That's a, that's a lot, that's a pretty impressive right there. Let's just summarize what we learned. Exercise coupled with diet is important for weight loss. Exercise increases your metabolism, which allows you to burn calories when you're at rest even. Exercise lowers your risk of heart problems. And we recommend to start with 30 minutes a day. And you want to make sure you increase your heart rate when you're exercising. This is just a reminder, uh, walking five days a week, and you can get credit for seven. The food items to avoid can be eaten once a week without penalty. And calling your group leader four times in a week is as good as seven. And remember to fill out your uh, electronic uh, card daily. Don't forget to avoid eating snacks between your meal. Eat less, especially supper time. Pray for motivation and strength to do best, right? This is key here. And uh, call your group leader and read your assignments. And uh, remember to get your five days of walking for 30 minutes this week. And that's the end of my presentation. I'll turn it over to the Eric here. Well, thank you, Edwin. That was uh, a great summary of why uh, exercise is important. Those are some impressive studies. Um, I enjoyed um, hearing again about the nurses study. That's one of the famous, very large epidemiologic studies here um, that we have access to that gives a lot of information about lifestyle. And I think that throughout this program, we'll hear more from um, uh, several different, very large epidemiologic studies and the common sense health approaches that they, they uh, suggest are helpful for us. Um, Dr. Abraham, I did wanna ask you just one question. And that question is, you're an anesthesiologist. Uh, I know you and I get to work together every now and then. Um, the joke is in the operating room, there's this thing called the blood brain barrier. There's a big sheet that goes <laughs> up between the surgeon down at the body cutting things and the anesthesiologist up at the head. So Dr. Abraham is the one with all the brains and on my side of the drape is where all the blood is. It's called the blood brain barrier. <laughs> so he's the intelligent one, one here. And um, when you're evaluating someone for surgery, uh, this is something that surgeons and anesthesiologists work together on. I know in my office, I try to give information to folks about what they can do to improve their risk of surgery. Um, when you're evaluating someone for risk of surgery, uh, whether in a pre-op clinic or uh, some other setting, how does the amount of exercise that they have been getting impact their risk of surgery? And what advice do you give people um, if you're seeing them several weeks before surgery? Well, that's a good question. Um, the main thing is anyone that comes for anesthesia, we want to evaluate to make sure their heart is good. Um, anesthesia it does, it's like a stress to the heart at times. So you, you can increase your heart rate, increase your, decrease your blood pressure. And uh, if your heart is bad, you know, it's not a good, it's more riskier to go under anesthesia. So one of the questions I ask is, you know, we can do, there's many tests out there to look at the, your heart functions. Um, there's like echoes and TEs. But for the regular person, they don't need to get this test. We usually ask them how much activity can they do? And remember we were talking about METs there. Uh, four METs is what the anesthesia guide is. You know, if they can do more than four METs, which is about middle activity, like walking up a flight of stairs, walking to their mailbox, that uh, lowers their risk quite a bit. So that tells me that their heart is good and um, of course, the more active you are, the healthier you are, the less, you know, the healthier you are, the less risk you have of going under anesthesia. Good. Well, thank you. I just had a gentleman this past week that I operated on that, um, unfortunately, his ejection fraction was well under 20%, and mm. um, he wasn't doing any exercise. Um, it's, um, so now he's in the ICU on continuous dialysis, three pressors, and I believe, I actually think he's going to make it because he's improving, but uh, it's, he did not do very well with surgery and we didn't want to operate on him, but it was an emergency. So in everybody, I encourage all of us, myself included, this is the one weak point I have with the best way program, you know, true confessions here. My wife is nodding her head up there somewhere. I need to get more exercise. Yeah, there she is. She's 
She's nodding her head wildly. Um, and this is something that I need to work on. So uh, thank you for that excellent um, uh, lecture, Dr. Abraham. And at this time, speaking of exercise, we have Dr. Laura Lucas, who is a doctor of physical therapy. And she's going to give us a short presentation about exercise because that's what we're here to talk about. And hopefully as many of these sessions as possible, she'll be here with us to lead us in some exercise as well. Dr. Lucas, the time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Um, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about burst training, which is a mechanism for how you exercise with whatever exercise you choose. So this works very well with walking. And tonight, I am going to use walking as my example. However, realize that this is um, just principles of how we train, and it can be used with other activities as well. Um, please make sure that you consult with your physician before you start an exercise program to ensure that they agree that an exercise program will, will work well for you. We, of course, want you to stay safe through this. So I would like you to learn some about taking control of your health with exercise, and I would like to introduce you to burst training today. The goal of burst training is to get you performing aerobic exercises. That means you're, you're getting your heart rate up, you're getting your breathing rate up, and you are doing that exercise. It is also known as cardiovascular exercise because it is working your heart and your breathing. Hey, Laura, let me interrupt you just for a short moment. There's something that says, please move this window away from the shared application. I don't know if you're able to get that off your screen somehow. I would um, love to move that window away, but I do not know how to get that away. And I keep going forward with my presentation. My apologies. There we go. Someone somehow moved it away from my screen for me. Thank you. Okay, so how will you know that you are performing burst training or any of these exercises that we are working on correctly? Well, as Dr. Abraham just led us through, you will notice a change in your breathing. That change in your breathing should make it more difficult for you to make a complete sentence without kind of huffing and puffing a bit, okay? So that tells you that you are on track with your breathing. You should notice a change in your heart rate. That's very easy to tell if you just lay your fingers up beside here. If you're not talking, then you won't feel your voice box moving and you instead will feel your pulse. And again, you can tell um, by being able to talk. If you are able to complete a sentence easily, you may not yet be at your target heart rate for exercise. So, um, the goal of burst training is to improve your body's efficiency in pump pumping blood because the blood carries the nutrients for us. It carries our water. It removes waste from our cells and it helps in the healing process. So all in all, we want our body to be efficient in pumping blood. Burst training is also known as high intensity interval training. So if you have never heard of burst training before, but you are very well versed in the exercise world, you're probably gonna be hearing of HIIT training or high intensity interval training. That is a similar type of activity. It is where you are performing bursts of activity at a higher intensity than what your normal pace would be. So burst training, the principle is you hit it hard and you take a break. Choose a form of exercise you can do easily and safely. And walking is an easy example, as I said, that we will follow tonight. So you're going to start your session by warming up, walking at a normal pace. You wanna spend three to five minutes walking at a, a normal pace, and then you can add a burst of activity. That burst of activity should not be an all out effort of everything you can give, because we want you to start to give several bursts in an exercise session. It should be a burst of activity that raises your heart rate, raises your breathing pattern, and makes it more difficult for you to say a complete sentence without a little bit of a gasp for air. Not agonal breathing, trying to, <laughs> trying to uh, get that very last breath that you may ever have. Okay, you want to increase your speed and go as fast as you can gently. If all you can do is just increase to a fast walk and not even a slow walk, slow jog, that's okay. If that's all you can do safely first, go for it. And you want to do this burst of activity for 20 to 30 seconds. 
a very short period of time, 20 seconds is a great time to start with. Especially if you're new to activity, 20 seconds is your good starting point. You want to complete your burst and return to walking at a normal pace. And you're going to repeat this pattern for three to five times in a single exercise session. So as you are out walking, after you have gotten a good three to five minute warm up, you're going to go at a harder level, going as fast as you think you can comfortably for a good 20 seconds. And then you're going to return back to your normal pace. You will do this again after your heart rate and breathing has slowed down. You will again repeat doing another burst of activity for that 20 seconds and then slow down to your normal pace again. Once your heart rate again has slowed down and you feel like your heart isn't trying to pump out of, its, out of your chest, then you will do that again. Complete at least three of those for a session, okay? Then once you have completed that last 20 seconds, don't stop there, please. You need to finish by a cool down, walking at a normal pace for your safety and your best health. Okay, again, you can spend three to five minutes cooling down at that normal walking pace. We need to remember that our goal should be to get our heart pounding. You are going to feel this in your chest. Once you have completed a burst, then you want your heart rate to slow safely to a normal training level. And for burst training, we try to do burst training three to six sessions a week. So in this program, we are aiming for that five times a week of walking at least three of those times aim for trying to add in a burst training session. The effects that we are going for with burst training is burst training can actually change how our body relates to insulin so that our body listens better to insulin, which then can help for those who are sensitive to insulin or have diabetes. It can also increase our body's fat burning, which is what we are looking for in this um, class. And so think of what your goal is. And as you think of your goal, think how can I add some burst training into my weekly exercise sessions? That completes my segment for this evening. I am happy to field questions in the chat and I will turn the time back over to someone else. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Lucas. I just wanted to, um... Uh, ask you one question that came to my mind. If someone is exercising kind of at their peak performance and all of a sudden they stop, what would be the danger there? I know what I've heard, but I don't know this for sure. And I wanted your expert opinion on that. So you're running full tilt. You've been doing this. You're an athlete. And then all of a sudden you stop. You don't do the cool down. Well, the cool down can cause very many problems, but the things that I have heard most about are cardiovascular events because you are not doing a proper cool down. Also, another um, thing to ensure that you always have with you during your exercise is your water bottle because you need to continue to be drinking and hydrating yourself so that you aren't putting your cardiovascular system into a dehydrating event before exercising. That can also lead to cardiovascular problems. Please make sure you are well hydrated as you're exercising. Yeah, that's what I'd heard as well. I mean, we don't realize that when we're walking, the muscles in our legs are actually doing part of the pumping of our blood. And if we suddenly stop, all of a sudden it puts a much harder load on the heart. So it's very important to have that cool down. Well, thank you very much. At this time, uh, I'm gonna turn the time over to Chris Anderson. And I hope that his, uh, his internet is better this week. I think he's gotten it fixed. I've seen some evidence of that. So Chris, I see your smiling picture there. I hope you're there. Are I'm you? here. There he is. Hey. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you. I hope my internet is better this week. Really had some challenges last week. But um, yeah, I just wanted to share a scripture with you that um, is really pertinent to this program. It says in 3 John verse 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. You know, the Bible recognizes that you're more than just a body. I think that's like stating the obvious, right? I mean, we're a body, we're a brain, and the Bible recognizes that we have a spiritual nature as well. And uh, that is an important part of our health. And so that's an important part of this program is we, we recognize that there is some key topics in scripture, some key guidance in scripture 
from the, from the very author that created us that can help us have optimum health. Um, and so I have a scripture I want to, I mean, I have a thought I want to share with you from the scriptures this evening. And it has to do with your New Year's resolutions. You know, we make resolutions every year, like I want to do this, or my wife and I, we want to, uh, add, to fix the siding on our potting shed and get it looking nice. You know, we have these resolutions. We had that same resolution last spring, and it has not been fixed. Um, but, you know, we, ha we have these resolutions in our life, and, it, when, and particularly when it comes to our health, you know, we're going to exercise, we're going to start walking, we're going to start eating right. And then sometime around, you know, maybe June or July or August, we're like, you know, I never did that. Or, or, or maybe for some of us, it's like January again, and we're like, ah, you know, I, I didn't do that resolution I had, I'd wanted to do yet last year. Well, what if the Bible taught a principle that if you apply this principle, that you would have success where you automatically did whatever that resolution was. I'm gonna share this key with you and it's found in Luke chapter four and verse 16. This is talking about Jesus. It says, um, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. This is the area where Jesus was brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So our custom is our habit. It's something we do regularly. So Jesus was found to have habits. His habit was that he went to church every week. That was an important part of his life. He had this regular habit that he had developed. The Bible teaches that we have habits, and habits are things that we do um, just all the time. Now, this actually has some bearing on your biology. See, the front part of your brain is called the prefrontal cortex, and way deep down inside, above your brainstem, is a little piece, a little uh, organ called your basal ganglia. The, uh, the basal ganglia is a place where your habits go. So in your prefrontal cortex is where you do all your thinking and processing. Uh, for some of us, we have more processing space. And for some of us, we have, like myself, less processing space in the, basal gang in the prefrontal cortex. Um, it can only handle so much information up there before it overloads. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you have ever driven a stick shift car? Can I see your hand? Wow, wow, I love it, I love it. Yeah, you ask young people that, like no one raises their hand. Um, so uh, I learned how to drive on a stick shift car. My stepdad taught me, bless his soul, and his poor his poor, trans, his poor clutch smelled burned, you know, <laughs> I feel bad. But anyway, he taught me how to drive on this stick shift car. The first time I drove the stick shift car, it was at their house and I was driving down the driveway of our house and I, it's a long hill and I got to the bottom of the hill and I turned left on the road and I went up a hill. They kind of live in a, in a hilly area. And I went up a hill and I came to the top of the hill and I had to stop at the stop sign. I was at the top of the hill. You get me. Those of you that have driven a stick shift car, you know what I mean. I'm on the top of the hill and, and I have the clutch in and I have the brake on and now I've got to go. So, um, so I tried taking off and I rolled back You know, I let the clutch out and I tried to give the gas and it stalled and shuddered and quit. Um, I was just so frustrated. And anyway, I, I kept trying. I backed halfway down the hill, but by, by the time I finally got it going, he had a little trick. He pulled up the emergency uh, hand brake handle and um, and held it while I got the clutch out and the gas in. I was able to work it and finally I got going. Wow, somebody is just blowing up my phone right now. Uh, it's distracting me. Try to put that out of my mind. Anyway, um, so all that activity was happening up here in my prefrontal cortex. Like my brain, this was new, you know? I mean, I'm learning how to do this and it's processing it right here. The very next day, as I came down the driveway and I, and I turned left on the road and I went up the hill, I got to the top of the hill, parked right at the top. Someone, they live in the country. Like no one ever drives on Varner Drive. I mean, it's just like remote. But that morning, someone pulled right up behind me while I was getting ready to shift and turn. I mean, I was just like, no, I'm gonna smash the car. And um, anyway, I was terrified. I mean, those of you that have driven stick shift, you know, how traumatic that is. Here's my wife, Faith. She's joining me. So um, over time, I got better and better and better at that until I would drive and not even realize I was shifting. How many of you know what I'm saying? Like over time, 
you just shift automatically. It's not, I mean, it's like you're driving an automatic car, but just, it just happens. You don't have to think about it anymore. Well, what happens is that process of shifting is no longer in your prefrontal cortex. You have done it over and over and over again, and it moves down into your basal ganglia and it becomes a habit, right? A habit. So some of our challenges every year, we, we do something new. We have a new year's resolution and it's something different. It's not a habit. What if, what if your resolution to be healthy, to live healthy, to have a healthy diet and exercise and everything. What if it wasn't something new every time? What if you had developed it in such a way that it's just what you did? It moved down into your prefrontal, I mean, into your basal ganglia and it became your habit. It became you. And like when people thought of you, they think of, well, this is a person that eats healthy, they exercise regularly. Wow, I want to be like that. How many of you would like to have that kind of habit? Yeah. Uh, so the way that habit happens isn't overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. That's one of the reasons this program is not one week long. It's not even five weeks long. It is 10 weeks long. So we're, we're hoping and working with you through this to help you develop a habit. Now, a habit only becomes a habit if you do it over and over and over regularly again. Take what you used to do and replace it. The, the best way, and I did say best way, the best way to develop a good habit is to do it right, okay? So we're trying to teach you, and I'm gonna say it again, we're trying to teach you the best way. So each one of these principles that you're learning every night, if you just simply incorporate it, figure it out, get in touch with your table helper, contact someone, say, hey, let, help me figure this out. How do I need to do meal planning? Uh, okay, I need to exercise. Actually put that into your schedule and actually do it so you develop the habit. And yes, I am talking to you, Dr. Nelson. Right now, you need to develop an exercise habit 30 minutes a day. Just make it a habit. So that's just what you do. It's just your way of life. Now, there's little tricks to that. Dr. Nelson, you might need to put your walking shoes beside your bed at night and your walking clothes so you're ready to go in the morning. Anyway, just develop, just develop the habit. And as you do that, it becomes a part of you and it's easy. It just becomes so much easier. So spiritually speaking, Jesus gave us an example. He had a habit that was beneficial in his life. The Bible clearly teaches that. Um, what do you do when you're overwhelmed and you're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make him, or maybe you make a mistake or something like that. You're worried about how, how you're going to have the strength to do it. Well, you've got a group here that's supporting you. We're together in this. You've got table helpers. You've got others that are your friends. Dr. Uh, Hillman is taking walks that you can join together and work at, do this in a group to kind of encourage each other. That's part of it. But I'm going to share with you a key, a profound key. It's one that really is true. I believe that God is real. He's not make-believe. This world came into existence because God created it. And I'm going to share with you something, a, a little tip from the scriptures that is profound. This is in Psalms 46, verse one. And the Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, the Bible says that God is a present help in trouble. It doesn't say that he might be sometime in the future or he used to be in the past, that he helped your neighbor, but he won't help you. No, it says that he is a present help in time of trouble. So if you're struggling with something, uh, God is a present help in trouble. Now, how do you access that help? I'm going to share it with you. I know you were waiting for this. And so here it is. This is in Psalms 91, verse 15. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. How do you access the help that God wants to give you? Call upon him. That's it. It's that simple. God Help me. I cannot help myself. I mean, you all know the story about Peter and he was slipping under the water. Lord, save me, he said. And he raised his hand and, and Jesus was there for him. As you, are, as you are developing habits that have taken a lifetime to shape, it's going to take more than human power to change those. Just being honest with you, you're going to need divine power. And that's only available through Jesus. 
And the scripture tells us that God is a present help in trouble. And he says, call upon me and I will answer. I will be with you in trouble. So that's my word of encouragement this evening. I wish you God's strength and power this week and develop those habits. You too, Dr. Nelson. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Chris. And I'll uh, see you backpacking this weekend. And I have no doubt that you will make it down the trail before I will. For those of you who don't know, uh, Chris Anderson uh, just runs marathons for the fun of it. And that just blows my mind. I don't understand how anybody could put themselves through that kind of thing for the fun of it. But I agree, exercise is important. And I am going to commit to do more exercise during this program, though it will not be a marathon. Just hate to break it to you. Um, that I think, thank you so much for that. This is one of the most encouraging parts of this program. Um, we firmly believe, I think all of us that are leading out in this Best Way program believe that uh, what Chris just shared is true. Habits are hard to change and God wants to help you. And so I, I really believe that. Um, habits are easier to change if the food you're trying to change it to tastes good. Um, if the food that um, you think um, is healthy for you uh, is just a few handful of nuts and Brussels sprouts, it may be that uh, you're less likely to, um, to want to eat it. So um, at this time, I think we're going to spotlight Rachel Detweiler, and um, she has some thoughts for us on eating. So Lucas, I think he was going to be spotlighting Rachel Detweiler. There she is. Rachel, the time is yours. I need to be unmuted. Yeah. I'm unmuted now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Well, I had a few goals to help you all out because I know that part of eating well is being able to do it quickly sometimes. So with that in mind, between that and making sure that you can find all of the ingredients easily, we've come up with a few recipes that are going to take you no time at all. So this first one is um, Italian chickpeas. Um, you'll see that all this requires is crushed tomatoes, um, diced tomatoes, chickpeas, a gigantic onion, it looks like it's gigantic, some garlic and some oregano. And you can even substitute out the onion and the garlic and use garlic powder and onion powder if you want. This is a very versatile recipe. So if you don't like chickpeas or you wanna try something else, you can use um, white beans, navy beans, um, lentils even. And you can buy all of those canned. They're easy to find at Walmart. I don't think any of you will have any problem doing that. And this is very simple. Um, let's see if I can get this thing running here. Oh dear, I'm sorry, hold on one. Just... Um, another thing is um, this recipe could be served over any kind of pasta or you could use rice or quinoa. And I chose um, a couple of different kinds of pasta. Maybe you've never tried these or seen these before, but you can buy pasta that's made out of chickpeas and pasta that's made out of red lentils. Um, you can buy rice pasta, you, but you want to find a whole grain or something that's made out of um, these simple ingredients as well. Let's see, let's try to get over here. Yeah. Um, with the onion and garlic that I used, I ended up just throwing it in the blender because I didn't want to take the time to chop it. And so I just blended the, the onion and garlic and threw it in a pan to saute it a little bit. You don't need any oil to do that. Um, and there's enough moisture in the onion that you can just dry it out a little bit and um, throw it right into a crock pot where I just dumped the rest of the ingredients and stirred it up and put it to cook on low for about six to eight hours. So you can set this at the beginning of your morning and it'll be ready for your, um, for your meal in the afternoon. If you, if you set it for high, you can put it on high, <laughs> sorry, or you can put it on low and have it for a, a quick evening meal. Now I will admit this makes quite a lot of um, ingredients or, or it makes quite a lot. I had, uh, I believe eight servings out of it and you could probably easily half the recipe that I made using, um, you know, 14 ounce cans of tomatoes and using one can of chickpeas instead. So if you're one or two people in your family, you will probably want to cut this recipe down unless you would like to freeze it. 
Um, so again, simple recipe didn't take any time at all. I probably spent five minutes making it and that included sauteing the onions and garlic. You wouldn't even necessarily have to saute the onions and garlic. Um, you could just throw them right into the, the cooker or you, again, you could use the onion powder or garlic powder. So very simple. And then um, we threw it on when, and um, at the very end of cooking our pasta, we threw some broccoli in to steam for a couple of minutes. And you have a very simple, easy meal that is very flavorful. Um, if you have a little more time or you wanna add a little more flavor or a little more nutrition, you can throw some extra um, greens in there throw some kale in with the, um, with the sauce. You could also throw some basil in at the end if you'd like, um, spice it up with, uh, with more spices of, of your uh, kind, maybe some Italian seasoning if you wanted, um, but lots of options for this, um, for this entree. Let's see, I think that's all the pictures I have to show. Um, and this is very, is something that's very helpful for any anybody, anybody can um, eat this, it's all plant-based, as you can see, and um, again, very simple. I will be having more things that hopefully will take less than five minutes for you to make. Coming I think that's all I got. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I really appreciate that. That was a beautiful looking uh, presentation of a very nice recipe that can be made in very short order. That was awesome. Thank you so much for, um, for doing that. Just a couple more announcements here. I did want to, again, highlight, you can go to southbaysda.org and then click on the best way link. That will give you the Zoom link for every meeting. I um, want to remind you to fill out your consent form to take this class if you have not yet done that. You can fill out your daily progress cards there. And they're underneath the best way link. There's also some tabs for the handouts that we usually would be handing you a paper copy of. But again, due to COVID, we're doing all of this online. Um, I'm just very excited about how this program is going. Um, the people in my group have been just having a great time and I've learned more about different forms of exercise this week than anything else. Um, I just am excited to hear how the Andersons have been uh, sharing cooking tips and remember that link under the best way tab about healthy cooking. There's some great extra, uh, great uh, recipes there that we'll be adding more there. And um, if you just want to, um, if you want to uh, access some good recipes, uh, please go there. Well, I hope you enjoyed the material from today. Take time to go through the workbook. Make sure to enter your information every day into the online scorecard. Remember to enter your weight once a week on Monday so that information is there. And remember to really try to make this a habit so it will just be natural for you to live out this lifestyle. We'll see you next week on Tuesday at 7 p.m.